<laughs> so uh, yeah, my MacBook Pro died today, but that was actually good because I was thinking about doing this in an entirely different way than before. All right, who's tired of slides? It's the end of the day. Some of you don't have beer. I don't know what your problem is. Um, <laughs> It, no, alcoholism is bad, uh, that's what my doctor tells me. So let's talk about building an enterprise uh, enterprise-scale cloud security automation. So a little bit of background, I got into security automation probably about seven years ago or so. I gave a presentation at Black Hat automating a bunch of security stuff for cloud. Uh, a bunch of people started asking me, where can we get your code? And that's led onto this research line and spinning off a company to do this kind of stuff and all sorts of things. And I've worked with a lot of organizations and of all different sizes. And when I first started doing this stuff in Amazon, everything was really small. And now the kinds of companies I'm working with have hundreds or thousands of Amazon accounts. And then they're getting pulled into multi-cloud through merger and acquisition and through all of these other issues. So a couple of level setting things before I get into this. One, I'm gonna use almost exclusively Amazon terminology. That's because I'm lazy, okay? Um, it also because this is a multi-hour presentation if I have to tell you how to do exactly everything across all the cloud providers. And the platform that I've built, or the platforms, because I've done this a few times now, have all been on the Amazon side even when they're connecting into the others. And that's just my own personal biases. However, everything I'm going to talk about will work across all of the cloud providers. All of the issues, maybe not exactly the same, are going to be similar across all of the cloud providers. So let's go ahead and jump into it a little bit. And what do I mean when I talk about cloud security automation? And there's really three domains that I tend to focus on. Uh, one is this concept, and it's a newer one, of cloud detection and response. You get events out of your cloud environment, and you want to be able to respond to those events. It could be an incident response kind of a situation, or it could just be guardrails or general housekeeping. There's also the guardrails themselves. If you do assessments and you get results you don't like, guardrails is how you're going to go ahead and automatically or interactively remediate those. Get a human involved, or in some cases, you can automatically fix those things. And yes, we know that there's you know, detective and preventative and responsive guardrails. There's different kinds of ones that are out there. And lastly, compliance, because auditors suck and we have to keep them happy or they make our lives worse. I like to describe auditors as accountants without personalities. <laughs> Usually, <laughs> Usually I, I ask if there's any auditors in the room first, and maybe I should have done that. So, oh, woe is with me. Oh, there's my email, you don't want to see that. So, I decided not to use slides. And what I'm gonna do is gonna walk you through the journey that I went through as I started building out automations, and I had to scale those automations. And so, the fundamental principle of all of this is I'm assuming multi-account environments, and I'm assuming that there's a whole different variety of automations that you want to run. And so what I've got sketched out here is these are the different cloud accounts, and these little dividers there represent, and I'm going to use Amazon terminology, the different regions. And you may or may not know, but regions are entirely separate endpoints. When you go to assess things, they're fully compartmentalized. So if I run an assessment on US East 1, Virginia, and US West 2 in Oregon, those actually have to run separately. So the first automations I built was, it was actually an incident response automation thingy. And it ran within my security operations account. And let me get this into edit mode. There we go. I've got my little pencil thing. And what I had in this account was uh, basically an instance, virtual machine there. And it actually could have run off of my desktop. There's plenty of automations that use that. Anybody use tools like Prowler and Cloud Mapper? You can run those in containers, you can run them in instances, you can run them in your desktop. And what that would have to do is it would serially reach out and touch each of those environments to run the automations. Now, as you can imagine, that's not overly efficient. One is it was running linearly. So basically all my code would have to run in order on that individual thing and run into that target on that individual thing. And that's how most of the tools that you see today, um, when it's like kind of the free open source like assessment tools, typically that's how they're gonna run, just because they're designed to be run by an assessor kind of on their laptop. And that's okay for small environments, but it's not gonna go ahead uh, and scale out into those environments there. And I don't care if that's an instance or if it's a set of containers that are poking into each of those accounts, you're gonna kind of run into those same obstacles. And I ran into those obstacles pretty quickly. So my first versions of these were something runs here 
and then it connects in to all the different environments and everything was running serially, linearly, like I talked about. So a linear automation is what I, w I used to call that early on. And that didn't scale. And as I started thinking about taking this from something I was running on my desktop to something I run into a larger environment, my next option was to get a little bit more uh, creative. So what we would do is I'd set up a auto scale group and it actually didn't have a load balancer for those of you that know what you're doing because I didn't need a load balancer for this. So in the auto scale group, that would launch all of my assessment instances. Now, that was hooked into a queue service and it was Amazon's simple queue service. And what I would do is pop in the, the controls which were run off of another instance or a container because I, this is migrated from instance based to container based um, because containers were like a very new thing when I first started building this. And so those messages would line up in the queue and each of these would pull a message down of what it was supposed to assess connect out into that target environment, do its job. Are my wife's text messages showing up on the screen there or just on my iPad? I'm just really <laughs> curious. Okay, that's, that's good. I, that's really good. So, um, happily married. And... <laughs> video, huh? Yeah. So, uh, and then those things would pop up. Now, I had, it was really cool. I'm like a big, massive security nerd. I've been doing that my whole life. So I'm the CISO of Disrupt Ops, analyst and CEO of it, Securosis, you might guess from the name, um, that I'm neurotic about security. And so we'd have instances that would run, do their job, shut themselves down, and then the autoscale group would like launch the next one. And that was kind of an early architecture for trying to be more scalable. Um, and that worked okay. Um, the problems that you run in is uh, there's, you know, first of all, the controller software, making sure that that's getting those messages in place, and also uh, cost and efficiencies, uh, because you obviously wanted to have your containers kind of running all the time and just having a pool of these things available. So it, it is effective, but potentially inefficient. And then it doesn't, there's a bunch of connectivity and other kinds of issues we're going to get into as I go through this journey. So um, the next version option that you could do I did not do. This is one that I've seen others do. And this is what I call basically a more distributed model. So the one that I just showed is centralized. Everything's running from one master account and connecting in. And what are some of the issues you face? One of the biggest ones is your IAM. Like how do you have permissions to go into those accounts? Especially if you built this before Amazon organizations existed, for example. Second is, is making sure you have the right permissions but not too many permissions in those accounts. And we're going to go ahead and, uh, and get to that. And third is, is just dealing with the requirements of the account owners. Because it's one thing to do a scan, it's an entirely other thing when you're going to do auto remediation. Or even security driven incident response uh, remediations. Like that is a massive political issue in any organization of scale. And that architecture that I just showed you, just so you know, that'll scale up to maybe hundreds of accounts, but not many thousands of accounts. Now I know people with, I know organizations with over three, over 5,000 Amazon accounts in their environments that have to do security automation. So another option is, is, you know, what if I have some kind of a controller up here in my SecOps account, but then I actually distribute in each region of my target accounts the actual thing that's running. And so that's my automation tool. So I've now distributed it where I have, it's basically, I'm creating my own cloud security botnet. So I've got my command and control server that's touching into those accounts, but the local thing is what's running either assessments or assessments and remediations or whichever other security automations you're gonna look at. This is not an uncommon model. And while I'm showing it instance or container based, I've also seen it a fair bit with Lambda functions. So security builds the cloud formation template, pushes the Lambda functions out into the distributed accounts, and then those Lambda functions are doing their thing. Uh, and this can be effective and, uh, depending on what your objectives are. Now understand that there are going to be some limitations. If you want centralized reporting and centralized management, this becomes more difficult because you need more bi-directional communications going on. Um, I actually was doing a thing, I was a briefing a Gartner analyst on some of this stuff, the commercial side of the things that I'm doing are, and he's like, well, it's a showstopper if you don't run something in somebody's account. And I'm like, well, I have central command and control, so who gives a crap? Like, if it's 
running in their account or it's all running out of my account because if you hack my account, you can use the command and control to do whatever in those other accounts. What really matters is your IAM. What permissions does that have in those accounts? And so that's, again, by the way, you do a lot of Amazon stuff, like all things are IAM. Like that's what it all comes down to and that's where your biggest headaches are. But that distributed model can work. And in particular, um, I've done some work with like, uh, I did work with a broker trader, Big Financial, where I helped uh, architect their system for this and I gave them a bunch of my code. And we set it up to run in this distributed model where they had some dashboard reporting at the top level, but all the actual guts that were working were distributed out into all of those environments. So it is a very, very uh, viable model that you can run into. So um, I had my little notes here for the pros and cons, but I think I've gone through most of that already. Uh, but again, the, the central management options is you can go serverless. Um, you can do centralized reporting, which is basically where you're taking the results out and you're feeding those back centrally. A lot of, and the simplest way to do this is how Amazon's now doing it for guard duty. Amazon couldn't get guard duty to be like effectively multi-region. So the way they solve this is go, hey, you can save your guard duty findings into an S3 bucket. And then that's the multi-region answer to this. So you can do that yourself. There's no limitations on that. Um, serverless, central reporting, you can do it container-based. Um, there's one, uh, if you're familiar with the tool called Cloud Mapper, written by this guy named Scott Piper. He actually has a version of it that's designed to run nightly, assess accounts, and aggregate results. There's a lot of interesting ways that you can do that um, with the distributed. But, you know, so the pros are is this allows for local control. Um, it allows for pretty decent code reuse. And it can support central. But what are some of the cons to this? Anybody maintain a Lambda function across a thousand accounts? So code maintenance is tougher. And then anytime you need to make changes to policies or anything else, so uh, change management overall becomes more difficult. And just maintenance um, of basically the, uh, the entire thing. Now I'm not putting those cons up or ending on the cons just to poop on that. It is a very, very viable option. Well, the other option is you go full centralized serverless. And this is kind of where mentally I've ended up going through this journey. Uh, it's also where multiple organizations I've worked with end up. Is anybody doing centralized serverless security automation? Nobody? Um, it really is done out there. And so basically, you build your serverless app up in your SecOps account. And then that is able to ping into all of your other accounts and regions. And let me just check my slides here. Um, so why do it this way? Scalability. I'm not dealing with a bunch of instances that I have to maintain uh, or containers. Like from a management perspective, if I have this in Lambda functions. And so here's an example of what this architecture uh, can go ahead and look like. So I've got everything I'm about to draw is mostly up in this serverless account. So one thing you're going to have is a controller. And the controller is determining which of these automations run. They can be manual, uh, or what we, I like to refer to as interactive, where you've got the human involved with it, triggered. It can be a time-based. Uh, it can be event-driven, which I'm going to get into, because I've got a lot more on event-driven stuff there. Um, and that controller makes the decision and says, for example, do X. So X is some particular automation. When it does that, it will send off into a message queue of some sort. And then typically SQS if you're doing Amazon stuff. Uh, there's cool things in the way SQS works is that messages in SQS can automatically trigger Lambda functions. So what that's actually going to do is you basically then get a one-to-one -one mapping of Lambda functions to accounts and regions. This is how you can do this massive scalability. They are all running in parallel to each other. So each of those is an individual Lambda function that's now running out of your core account, that's doing whatever it needs to do across all the accounts and all the regions within scope. You can also pass in different kinds of filters and such as well, such as treat accounts tagged dev differently than you treat accounts um, tagged as prod environment. And all of those do their work. What unites them all is a job ID. 
so that when you say, I want you to run this assessment configured this way, that job ID runs and each of these runs on its own and will actually return their results. And typically you're going to use like Dynamo or something on the back end to keep them. I think we switched our platform to, one of the developers switched it to Postgres for reasons that were not clearly explained to me, but apparently CISOs aren't allowed to make all, every architectural and code decision in the platform. Um, because I suck at writing code myself. So it's just the little things that always cause issues. Um, so you unite it all with that job ID. You can pull all of those results in centrally and then you can send that in for your dashboarding, your reporting, or however you're using it. The other part of that is, is if you're good about how you put those messages in, if you only want to run a subset of those automations, then you can say only run it on this environment, only run it on this environment. There's obviously app logic um, that's involved in there and that all comes down to how you uh, design it off into the controller. Any questions about this before I move on to some more of the descriptive stuff and some of the problems that you're still going to encounter? This is the architecture I like. It's a microservices driven kind of a thing, um, but it is harder to build. And that's some of the blockers. So the obvious ones, which I wrote down so I wouldn't forget them, are IAM and service limits. And I'm not going to talk about those right away because I have an entire another thing to go into the IAM and the service limits, um, particularly in how to respond to those. But dealing with identity management across this large scale of accounts and potentially different permissions within each of those accounts, like that's huge. That's a very, very difficult problem to solve. The other is, is the service limits issues, where if I go to like run a linear assessment, in particular, that's the most common one we run into those service limit issues where you're running a bunch of describe calls on an account. Not only are you going to hit service limits, but you're going to time out your lambda functions, depending on how that stuff is defined. And so I'm going to go into some potential solutions um, for that one. But the other, the other parts of this is just the um, increased, uh, basically it's an increased complexity because you know, you're now, instead of having like a contained code base in a container, you're managing hundreds of Lambda functions, different Lambda functions, maybe thousands of different Lambda functions. And you have to have your controllers and your queues, and you've got to deal with, um, uh, you have to deal with concurrency issues and race condition kinds of things and all of that, those kind of aspects of it. So what you're doing is you're shifting, you're increasing your complexity in dealing with serverless apps. And, and by the way, it is very doable. I'm not trying to dissuade you. I just don't want you to think I am overly simplifying the challenges of running a large scale serverless app uh, application environment like this for the security automation. Um, so one of the places I went where I wrote code that was, it was like Ruby code on a desktop. That's what I wrote it for them for. And they actually converted it into, well, Ruby code and Lambda functions, which is interesting because Lambda doesn't support Ruby. So they were actually compiling my code as JRuby and then linking it in and running it off of Lambda functions. Um, I, God have mercy on their souls. Like my code's not ever meant to be run in production. Just let's be clear about that, okay? I am not a production coder. I'm a, a hacker. I hang out at DEF CON. So um, I work at DEF CON. So there's the complexity issues can be problematic. Um, the other is your biggest blocker that I ever encounter in any of these situations is your org chart. Because once you move past assessment to kind of fixing things and security touching different environments from a central location and making changes across different application and organizational silos, like that is a problem. So I hear that a lot where it tends to be problematic, especially because these aren't considered incident response scenarios per se. They're considered like general, like just don't make your S3 bucket public kinds of scenarios. So those are a bunch of the blockers that we come into. Now I said that some of these are manageable. Now here's kind of a creative solution I came up with um, for on the IM piece, which is how do you manage access for security changes into environments and the ability to change permissions as you need to but do it in a secure way. It used to be much harder, but Amazon's made some changes in the past year or so that make it easier. And so to manage your IAM at scale, and here's what I mean by this. Imagine you have built an automation to find public S3 buckets, one of the easiest things out there. Great. Now you want to build an automation to get SSH access. If you set your permission across 300 accounts to allow you to look at S3 stuff, and now you have to add permissions across 300 accounts to make SSH changes, how do you do that? 
because you probably deployed your initial permissions using something like a cloud formation template as part of your landing zone. Great, nice, normal stuff. Now you need to change your permissions and you need to do it at scale. And what if you want to make changes on like a daily or weekly basis, you should add more and more automations, more and more remediations, more and more event response stuff. That means making those changes at scale. So here's uh, one of the, the ways I came up with to do it. So I have two environments. One is the provisioner and one is the worker. And for the stuff that I've built, those are actually two separate accounts in Amazon. Totally separate accounts. Those accounts are joined by SQS, message queue. And so when the worker side, which is where all the application logic lives, says we need a new permission or I need to provision a new account, that gets dropped to the provisioner. Now, within each account, there's two cross-account roles. One for the provisioner, one for the worker. And the provisioner has IAM and can adjust the privileges on the worker and nothing else. The worker can't touch the provisioner. This is both by their inherent policies and also reinforced with the permission boundary. It's another extra little feature. And you could actually add an SCP onto this if you want to. And so when the provisioner needs to make a change, it goes ahead, uses its role, and can change the privileges to the worker and do it at scale. You go, that's great, but it's still centralized. What if you want to give that account owner control? There's a couple of different ways that you can manage that. One is you can cut out the provisioner and you can make them just manually make the changes to the worker. Error handling, as long as you've got that, you'll see you have permissions issues. So they can retain full control over the permissions of what that worker can do in their environment. The other is, is you can, um, we actually, I, I set a thing up where here there can be, um, when you do an assume role across accounts, there's something known as, as an external ID. And this is an Amazon thing. Well, that external ID in the provisioner accounts is encrypted. And so the provisioner system itself doesn't know it. And the only way to unlock it is with a password that can be handed over from the worker. So it's actually a way that you could require human interaction. Now right now, uh, with the current system I've built, it's hard-coded, but it can be updated so that if those permission changes go through, that's only possible if the account owner puts in that password, or you can make your life easy and just have them put in the external ID if they remember it, but then that would decrypt basically that external ID which allows that connection to work. A uh, little bit of engineered security complexity, but I think it's a pretty cool way of solving that problem. Now, service limits is the next one. And service limits get kind of messy, because if you don't know, there's only so many API calls you can make to Amazon services, specific services. Does anybody know what the service limits are? Low. With low? Yeah. No, seriously, does anybody know? Because Amazon doesn't publish it. They won't tell you you can make n number of API calls per minute for various services. So how can you kind of get around those service limit issues? And the service limits are a real pain in the butt. So if I have my controller up here, which isn't always going to be a message queue, I can spin off either my Lambda functions or my containers. This applies to all of the architectures. One of the things that is interesting is that within each region, every AWS service has a different service endpoint. And the service limits are tied to the endpoint. So the EC2 has an endpoint. IAM has its own endpoint. So I can hammer them at the same time, but they're separate. There's like 60 different or more service endpoints within AWS, each with their own service limits. Earlier I showed you how to hit all of the regions and all of the accounts at the same time. The next step up, and this is what serverless lets you do, is give you the ability to hit the service endpoints themselves individually. Horizontal scaling, and this is why I really push people towards using serverless. Because service limits are defined by the service endpoint in a region in an account. And so this allows you to distribute more evenly across the service endpoints and across the regions and across the accounts to the best of your ability. Now the problem is, is if you want to do more complex assessments, this next piece I'm talking about 
works for assessing and analyzing. It does not work for making changes. When you go to actually do write events, you always have to hit the endpoint to hit a write event. But a lot of what we do is assessment, the configuration management pieces. So I take those results from all those service endpoints and I stick them into a database. Um, current one we're using is Elasticsearch for it. Then you run your analysis against your database. And you can run as many assessments as you want, as much performance as you want to allocate for your database without breaking the service limits underneath. So I've got a system now. We assess every 40 minutes, every account, every region is refreshed. All those service endpoints, pulling that data in. And then the assessments run against that because you can run as many assessments as you want or as we want without us having to hit those service limits. Um, and somebody was asking later if I knew what GraphQL was. Yep, because that's what we're actually using. GraphQL is really, really sweet for this. So to run those assessments um, and to be able to actually hit all of those regions and uh, do all of that simultaneously. The advantage of GraphQL as well is you can do much nicer queries than if you're doing dir direct describe calls. The early stuff I wrote, I'd be like, describe security groups and then roll through the security groups to describe all the rules and get all the info I want. When I throw it in a GraphQL database, it's a really simple query and then I can correlate that in like two lines to which instances are in that security group. So instead of knowing what security groups have port 22 exposed, I tell you what instances are exposed and which security groups don't have those exposures. So it's pretty fun stuff. Now with the guardrails then you're also dealing with this is how do you actually remediate these kinds of things. I'm going to skip a little bit for time's sake where the early versions of this, there's a controller and more SQS messages. Where I've headed, where we, uh, my organization is headed, is doing this and making it event driven. And events can be different things. So one set of events is the actual assessments, the results, like we found port 22, that can be triggered as an event into the event pipeline. Another event could be just a schedule trigger. And the schedule trigger, uh, I'll go into that. And then the other is APIs. You can stick an API gateway to actually generate events. And that's going to be really important and a reason. All those events go into the same event bus. Weirdly, we are using SNS. Um, I had thought Kinesis was going to be better for our internal event bus. And for a variety of reasons, it turns out SNS is an easier place to start. Uh, and longer term up to certain volume of events where cost becomes an issue. Uh, I, I was even talking to somebody who does very, very large stuff in a very, very big cloud org. He's like, yeah, stick with SNS as long as you can for dealing with your event bus stuff due to some, some things related to Kinesis. And some of those events, results could say, I want you to assess. So that'd be like the schedule one. I want you to assess or I want you to fix or I want you to respond like quarantine. Um, one that we've done is you get, there's certain kinds of abuse on IAM, you can actually trigger an automatic quarantine of that particular user. And so once you move to this event driven architecture, really ties these serverless pieces together uh, in a much more uh, effective and scalable way. You're still gonna deal with authentication issues, region issues, and the confused deputy problem, which I don't have time to fully talk about, but if you're collecting events directly from an account environment, how do you know that that event really came from that account? And so there's things you need to do. Um, basically, you can do correlation between the event header and the message bodies. And you can also use shared secrets or two techniques that can actually help you with that. The other is scaling of your event collection. If you use like API gateways, you're going to hit throttling, uh, for example. So you might want some other ones. And then cost, because collecting events at scale can be expensive. There's also a, distribu a distributed, um, I don't even know the right way to call this problem. But basically, one of the big issues with uh, Amazon is pulling events out of all of the regions is more painful than it should be due to certain decisions Amazon's made that you can ask me about later. But you have to like literally inject Lambda functions in every region to pull events out of regions. You can correlate multiple accounts uh, across accounts, but that will only work within that one region. So if you want to pull CloudWatch events or Guard Duty events out of a region, you've got to use Lambda functions to do it. And so where that gets you is, is you have all of these event feeds now coming from your accounts. And one of the cool things as you move more into this real-time detection and response is, instead of running like scheduled assessments, how about I pull all of my CloudTrail logs and I look for any create 
update destroy events in my CloudTrail logs, and I use that to go ahead and trigger another assessment. So now those distributed Lambda functions, instead of running on like schedules, they're gonna hit a single endpoint for a single resource only when that resource changes. By the way, you still want time-based ones to sweep through and find things that you might have missed. And that's kind of cool. You now have a near real-time picture of what's going on across hundreds or thousands of your Amazon accounts, centralized. And then you can use those to do assessments like this security group changed. So did it make an exposure to the internet? And if the assessment says yes, that gets thrown back into the event pipeline because that's a new kind of an event. And you can use that to trigger an action. And this is meant to represent the rules engine. How does this all work? So we started with basic assessments, basic guardrails, and now moving into this event-driven architecture, you are able to do things like build a CloudWatch rule that triggers a Lambda function that sends an event in any time there's a change to a security group. Or honestly, you pick all the cloud trail changes. That feeds internally, then you can do an assessment. Does this meet the rules? Are, and this is where it's more advanced than like the config stuff some people have talked about earlier. You can put rules in place. How is it tagged? Who made the change? What environment is this in? What are the actual IP addresses that have been exposed? Is there an instance running behind it? What's the tag of that instance? Much more application analysis logic if you want. And then if it determines that a change needs to be made, it can either trigger an immediate reassessment or trigger an automated remediation. Or just send an alert to a security admin to look at it. And so that there's a human eyeball on it. Or even better, use chat ops. Send that alert off to the person who made the change and said, did you mean to do this, yes or no? And then if they said no, it triggers a whole different kind of a security incident. So look, I had 30 minutes. This is like days worth of talking about this stuff. I am out of time today. Hopefully I gave you guys some ideas about how you can kind of scale these things up. And in future, we can talk about things like CI and CD and exemptions and undoing in different environments and all of those kinds of issues that come into place. Um, I just hope I kept you awake for the last session of the day. All right, thanks. <laughs> Screw you, Apple, I don't need my MacBook. <laughs>